So a while back, a friend suggested that I try making something pink. I was unaware of any pink metal salts, so I got to Googling. And while doing my research, the most promising compound that I came across was cobalt-2 chloride, and read that cobalt was a primary component of many types of lithium-ion batteries. While I shelved the idea at the time, I've recently found myself going down an informational rabbit hole learning about how lithium-ion batteries work, the issues faced with recycling them on an industrial scale, the variety of materials and compositions used to make them, but most interestingly of all, and the theme of this video, techniques for extracting metals from the raw batteries, specifically cobalt and lithium. Put simply, lithium ion batteries are composed of four main components. They have a cathode, an anode, a membrane, and an electrolyte. The anode is normally composed of a thin copper sheet layered with a graphite grid and is where the lithium ions migrate to as the battery charges. As the battery is discharged, the lithium ions travel through the selectively permeable membrane to the cathode, which is usually a thin aluminum sheet layered with a type of metal oxide, where the lithium ions integrate into a much more stable state. The metal oxide, which is the target of the experiment, can come in many flavors, with some incorporating nickel, manganese, iron, cobalt, or a mix of them, known as NMCs. There are several ways to extract the oxides from the cathode, however I chose to use the acid base extraction as it's the only one that I've found that will allow for the extraction and separation of both the cobalt and the lithium. In order for this technique to work though, the aluminum must first be separated from the oxides prior to dissolving them in the acid. Unfortunately, the metal oxide layer is often bound to the cathode by a strong chemically resistant adhesive. While the adhesives can vary, I figured that the most likely candidate was polyvanillidine fluoride or PVDF. After looking at the properties of industrial solvents used to dissolve PVDF, I figured that acetone may have a shot at being able to separate the oxide layer from the aluminum. So I put all of the cathode sheets into a jar and filled it with acetone. I let that sit for about a day and noticed no difference at all, so I moved everything into a round bottom flask and let it heat under reflux for a couple of hours. I realized that while the acetone did seem to be loosening things a bit, it seemed to require frequent agitation along with the refluxing in order to effectively work, something that I just wasn't going to bother with. So I moved everything out and instead opted to use sodium hydroxide to separate the layers. The sodium hydroxide should react with the aluminum in a highly exothermic reaction producing a water-soluble sodium aluminate and hydrogen gas. Once it's finished, I filter out the remaining solids, which I wash with lots of distilled water until the pH neutralizes. And then after drying, I'm left with my own beakerful of what the industry has affectionately nicknamed black mass. Now, I had initially done this experiment in two different sets. One using the three batteries that I pulled out of the laptop casing seen at the beginning of the video, and another using two 18650 batteries that I pulled from an old portable charging pack. The three mobile device batteries that I had tested on prior proved to be lithium cobalt oxide, so I was fairly confident that the laptop batteries would be as well. But I was unsure about the two 18650 batteries, so I kept them separate throughout the steps. Funnily enough, only after I finished the experiment did I realize that the 18650 composition was written right on the side. It was labeled ICR18650. And if I had bothered to do any research into the labeling schemes for 18650 batteries beforehand, I would have realized that ICR stands for Lithium Cobalt Round Cell. Don't ask me why the I stands for Lithium, because I don't know. So for the rest of the video, there will be separate samples, one labeled LIPO for the laptop batteries, and the other labeled 18650. Now that I had hopefully removed all of the aluminum from the cathode material, I can dissolve my black mass into some hydrochloric acid. I added hydrogen peroxide out of habit with the intention of helping the reaction along, which in hindsight was pointless because the metal should already be in their oxide forms, but in reality this was actually counterproductive. What I believe happened is the hydrogen peroxide actually acted to oxidize the divalent cobalt ions into their trivalent forms. Trivalent cobalt reacts with chloride to form cobalt 3 chloride, which is extremely unstable and immediately decomposes to produce cobalt 2 chloride and chlorine gas. As a consequence, I probably ended up using considerably more acid than was necessary and heavily diluting my solution for no good reason. As an interesting side note, cobalt chloride displays a unique property in that it can undergo a reversible color change simply by adjusting its temperature. In solution, cobalt chloride exists in an equilibrium between its tetrachlorocobalte ion and hexa-aqua cobalt ion forms. At higher temperatures, the equilibrium favors the tetrachloroform, which appears as a dark purple-blue color. When cooled, the equilibrium favors the hexa-aqua form, which appears rose-red. Now that everything is dissolved, boiled down, and filtered, I'm ready for the next step. By adding sodium hydroxide to my solutions, I can precipitate out all of the cobalt and other potential transition metal contaminants as their respective hydroxides. 
Lithium hydroxide, however, is highly soluble and will remain in solution during filtration. In order to limit the amount of sodium added to my lithium solution, I opted to initially neutralize most of the excess acid using an ammonium hydroxide solution to bring the pH up to about 2 to 3. Past that, it stops acting as a base and starts acting as a ligand to form cobalt amine complexes. Once at the desired pH, I start adding sodium hydroxide until I reach a pH of about 12. I expected the lavender colored precipitate to change to a light pink, but that did not occur. Like cobalt chloride, cobalt hydroxide also has some interesting properties to it. When a strong base, such as sodium hydroxide, is added to the solution of cobalt chloride, a dark blue precipitate is formed known as alpha cobalt hydroxide, which complexes with other anions in solution. At high pH, the alpha form rapidly decomposes to the more pure beta form that appears as a light pink precipitate. While I'm not exactly sure why this transition did not occur in my main experiment, I would guess it has something to do with the solution being too concentrated prior to the addition of the sodium hydroxide. In my 18650 solution, I decided to add an excess of ammonia to test the effect on the precipitate, reaching a pH of about 4. As I add the sodium hydroxide, the precipitate appears to go through several different states of complexion as it goes from burgundy to blue-gray to lavender, back to blue-gray, and ending in a light blue once the pH reaches 12. I let everything sit overnight to settle, then decanted off the liquid containing my lithium hydroxide, and then filtered my hydroxide precipitate using lots of distilled water. At one point I also accidentally spilled a large portion of my purple precipitate. While I attempted to save what I could, I probably ended up losing about half of my total yield, which was a real bummer. I placed everything outside to dry in the sun, ground them up with a pestle and mortar, and stored them into some small glass bottles. While I never bothered to predict my hypothetical yield, my actual yield came up to 33.3 grams for the blue precipitate and 13.18 grams for the purple precipitate. Next, I put a small amount of each hydroxide into a beaker and redissolved them in hydrochloric acid. While a detailed explanation is beyond my ability, cobalt can complex with ammonia and other ions to form a variety of different coordination compounds, which is a possible explanation for why the two hydroxides appear different in color. My thought was to purify everything by redissolving in acid and then precipitating it back out as a cobalt carbonate. While I'm sure the actual chemistry is much more nuanced, I figured that if the carbonate precipitate produced from both hydroxides have the same appearance, it would suggest a relatively pure product with the unwanted ligands being left behind in the solution. I then neutralized the pH by adding equal amounts of sodium carbonate to each beaker which began instantly precipitating out a beautifully fluffy pink cobalt carbonate. After filtering and drying all the precipitate, I was happy to see that both appeared the same shade of dark purple, so I moved forward with processing the rest of my hydroxides. In the end, I was left with 48 grams of a dark purple cobalt carbonate and a perfect precursor to other cobalt salts.
Now I turn my attention back to the lithium. There is only one practical way to separate the lithium from the sodium in the solution, and that is to exploit the low solubility of lithium carbonate. Interestingly, lithium carbonate solubility actually decreases as the temperature increases. So I start by boiling down my solution just until I notice solid starting to crash out of the solution, then add a bit of water to redissolve it. I mix up a solution of concentrated sodium carbonate, and as I add it, a clear white precipitate can be seen appearing in the solution. I let this mix on high heat for about 10 minutes before immediately filtering it. I then rinse the precipitate with lots of boiling hot distilled water. After drying, I move the lithium carbonate to some glass bottles with a final yield of just over 14 grams. One of the unique things about lithium is that it burns a bright pinkish red color when placed into a flame. So in order to verify that I did in fact extract lithium carbonate, I dissolved a bit in some nitric acid to form a few milliliters of concentrated lithium nitrate. Then I dipped a glass rod in the solution and held it to my torch, and just as I had hoped, I got a nice pink-red flame.